o'clock, I think we could probably get started. Um, I want to, Kelly, did you want to start or? Sure, sure. Um, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Ali. She is a neurosurgeon with us at Spectrum Health and um, will educate us all tonight about deep brain stimulation. So we're excited to have her and we're also um, continually excited to work with Mary Sue and the Michigan Parkinson's Foundation to facilitate um, these virtual meetings during this tricky time right now. So we appreciate everybody joining and flexibility. Oh. And thank you for joining tonight, Dr. Ali. We can't wait to hear from you. Thank you for uh, the invitation, Mary Sue, and thank you for that wonderful uh, introduction, Kelly. Um, I'm very excited to, to speak to the group tonight. I hope this talk is, um, you know, serves as a basis um, of understanding uh, what we do when we talk about doing deep brain stimulation surgery for Parkinson's disease. Um, so uh, I uh, recently moved to West Michigan about two years ago um, after doing my residency at Henry Ford in Detroit and then a fellowship at Vanderbilt University in movement uh, disorders. And I'm very excited to be a part of the, uh, of the team at Spectrum. I have no disclosures. Uh, We'll be talking about uh, a few things today. We'll talk about deep brain stimulation. We'll talk then about some emerging technologies that are coming out into the field and then some uh, research endeavors uh, that are ongoing. So to answer the question, what is deep brain stimulation? It basically means we put a small wire into an even smaller part of the brain and we electrically stimulate it or pass a very low amplitude of current through a certain area of the brain. So why do we do it? Well, we know that deep brain stimulation is better than continued optimized medical therapy, which basically means you can have the best medications, you can be at the optimal dose for those medications, but still without DBS surgery, you are not going to achieve the potential improvement that uh, you're entitled to. So we have two very good uh, randomized control studies, which is basically the highest level of medical evidence you can have for a particular therapy that tell us that deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease is better than continued medical therapy. Now, we do DBS surgery, but does it, does it last? Is it something that will wear out or give out over the course of a few years? Well, we have really good evidence to suggest that the, the effects of DBS last a really long time. Uh, this is a graph that I uh, got from a study and I think you could see my mouse. This is where people were at baseline without medications. That's what the black bar indicates. And this is with medication. So this is before they had any type of deep brain stimulation surgery. This gray bar here denotes um, what their motor symptoms are um, with DBS and medications. And it's low at one year and it continues to be low when these people are followed up to five years. So lower motor scores means you are doing better. You have better control of your symptoms. Mm -hmm. Now, when we talk about what areas of the brain to target, there are uh, three main areas that we talk about when it comes to Parkinson's disease. The top two are the most commonly used, which is the subthalamic nucleus and the GPI. And in some cases, we use a target called the VIM um, only when uh, folks have a combination of symptoms that make us think that they have both essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. So the, the area to target depends on what symptoms you have. 
And a very, very good rule of thumb is the symptoms that respond to your cinemet are the ones that are going to respond to DBS. And then based on which of these symptoms are most bothersome or are most prominent in your case will also help us choose a good target. So whether you have slowness of movement, stiffness, um, or is it mostly just tremor that bothers you? Do you have any features of dystonia, which is where your hand or your foot or your entire leg might be stiff and turn uh, inwards? Um, and those can be pretty painful conditions as well. What your cognitive status is? Have you started to show some decline um, as a result of your diagnosis? So we in the world of neurosurgery get very, very excited when we have uh, big studies to help us compare two different strategies or two different targets because these types of studies are very, very hard to conduct um, in the surgical field. Uh, but we're lucky that with Parkinson's disease, we actually have very good studies that have compared these two targets. And when it comes to controlling your symptoms, both targets are the same. But the level of depression can worsen with one target and improve with the other. So if somebody has an underlying um, diagnosis of uh, anxiety or depression, we tend to sway more towards one target versus the other. Um, but then on the flip side, the same target that leads to a little bit more depression than the other um, helps us reduce medications much better. So if you're most troubling symptoms are medication-induced uh, dyskinesias, those abnormal movements that you get when you're uh, uh, completely medicated, then we might choose the STN target so we can cut down some medications and uh, improve those pesky side effects. This is just a cartoon diagram to show you where these leads go. So these blue wires are our leads. And this kind of shows you where the, where the circuit is interrupted in Parkinson's disease. It's a tiny little nucleus. We're talking millimeters here. We're talking, you know, about five millimeters across is how big this area is. And this green, um, uh, this yellow um, structure is the target. Uh, the green ball kind of shows you uh, where we put the base of the lead. And then you can see there are multiple structures which are very, very close proximity to where the ideal location of our lead needs to be. Um, so uh, we're, we're talking millimeters here, which is why we have to be very, very precise in the work we do. This is another illustration of the the second target, the GPI, which uh, which shows you this is this dark green nucleus of the GPI, but it's very close to several other structures. Um, and if we're off by even a millimeter or two, it can really take away from the benefit of deep brain stimulation surgery. Um, so one way for us to figure out if we're in the right spot is to do what's called microelectrode recordings. These are recordings that we can um, do while you are in surgery uh, by inserting tiny wires into the area uh, that we're targeting. Uh, when a patient is asleep, um, it's harder to record these. We don't see certain signature patterns that we are looking for, which is why the preference is we will do the surgery awake so we can record your brain activity. And um, without belaboring things too much, you can see um, this blue line is very different from this blue line, which is different from this blue line. So it's, these, uh, it's the sound that the cells make when we put that little recorder uh, electrode in there. And it's the, it's the change in the squiggliness of these lines that tell us exactly where we are in the brain. And that also helps us make sure that we are in the perfect spot. Um, DBS, uh, you know, one 
common question that patients will have for me at least is you know when uh, when they don't have much experience with dbs is whether or not insurance is going to cover it is it still considered experimental and the answer is no it's been fda approved for a very long time and one of the reasons that it, the approval uh, sailed through without significant issues was um, there's a cost saving you can think that when we're doing surgery when we're implanting hardware in someone um, it would mean that the costs are exponential, but that's certainly not the case. This uh, red line indicates the cost of medication in a patient with Parkinson's disease throughout the course of their life without DBS. This line shows you the cost of medications once you get DBS. So the medication costs do go up because patients age. Um, you know Parkinson's disease is um, is a disease that does get worse with time. It's a progressive neurological disorder. So DBS will not slow that progression down. Therefore, you will continue to need more medications as the disease progresses. But the amount of medication you take and the cost associated with it once you do get DBS surgery is significantly lower than without it. Um, another common uh, yet hot topic for us uh, in the world of deep brain stimulation surgery is whether to do it awake or asleep. There are people who will swear by one or the other, but looking at it objectively, uh, both are very good options. Uh, we, we decide uh, whether a case should be done awake or sleep based on certain patient-related factors, uh, but in terms of the effectiveness of the surgery, we know that whether you do DBS surgery asleep or awake, your outcomes are going to be the same, which means the benefit that you get from DBS will be the same. However, um, with awake DBS surgery, we are not only able uh, to test the effect of the stimulation where we, if you have a tremor, we can halt it when we stimulate it and we know that we're in the perfect spot. We can also map out for side effects, you need a medication here on. which means uh, we can make sure that the current isn't spreading to all those uh, areas close by to the lead that I showed you guys earlier, which is very, very helpful. Um, and if we need to make any adjustments, we can do that during surgery. We don't have that benefit when we're doing the surgery asleep. But on the flip side, when we are doing the surgery asleep, it's associated with fewer complications. Um, the patients tend to recover just a little bit better, uh, mostly because we're doing one single pass uh, because we've already picked the area that we're going to put the wire in, and we're not uh, putting in multiple wires to record from different areas. So at Spectrum, I just wanted to take you through the evaluation process if any of you are in the process of going through an evaluation for DBS surgery or are exploring that option. We at Spectrum have a very well thought out process. It's very efficient where we do a two-day evaluation process for all of our patients. During these two days, patients will see seven different specialists, including neurology, neurosurgery, neuropsychology, psychiatry, physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy. Once all of us have seen the patient and evaluated them, we will then all sit down together and go over our impression. And if all of us are on the same page, we will go ahead and proceed with surgery. So it's a very well thought out, very multidisciplinary, patient focused way of assessing someone's uh, ability to go through DBS surgery and benefit from it. We have all, pardon the pun, the entire spectrum of options uh, available for DBS surgery. We can do it awake, we can do it asleep. Um, Myself and my partner, Dr. Hayden Boyce, do the surgery at Spectrum Health, and um, we both um, uh, 
decide along with our neurology team if a patient is a candidate for awake or asleep surgery. And based on that, we'll decide what type of frame to use, what system we're using, but every type of technology that's out there is available at Spectrum and we're very proud of it. Um, when I started here, um, I brought in a slightly newer frame system that has not been used in Michigan before. Um, the reason I decided to use that particular type of frame was because of increased patient comfort. Um, so this white thing is the frame that I use. And the reason for using it is, um, you know, any of you are familiar with the, the older frame. This is a picture of it. This is how it's mounted on your skull. This is, you know, a mo skull model, obviously. Uh, and the Lexel frame kind of sits, there's four posts that fix the frame to your head and your head then gets attached to the bed so you can move throughout the procedure. Now these surgeries can last two, three, four hours at times and it's hard enough for any of us to sit still for four hours. Imagine somebody with a movement disorder. You know, your body is telling you to move around. And, you know, we have you awake and kind of fixed to the table. It's not a very comfortable experience. So um, now that we've honed our technology to a point where we're very comfortable uh, achieving great results, we wanted to make it a better uh, experience for the patient as well, which is why uh, I started to use this newer frame system. Uh, so we can completely eliminate the need for a big, bulky, uncomfortable frame. It's easy, it's uh, convenient, it's light. Um, and it also helps us get through surgery a lot faster on the day of. So instead of your head being in a frame that then that's attached to the bed, this frame actually sits on top of your head like a little tiara. And we can do surgery um, through these two holes that sit on either side of your skull, especially if we're doing leads on both sides. So the way the surgical process works is a three-step process. The first step and the last step are outpatient, which means you come in the morning and you go home the same day and are done under general anesthesia. The middle part where we actually put the lead is one where we keep you in the hospital. And this is the point where we decide if we want to do a sleep or awake surgery on you. So the first step, you come in, we put you to sleep, we put in four tiny screws underneath your scalp into your bone, we get a high resolution MRI and CT scan and send you home. Then the neurologist and myself will sit down together, pick the perfect target, and uh, based on our uh, agreement, we'll send this information to a company that will then 3D print this frame for you. So this frame that you get on the day of surgery is specifically designed for your brain to be that precise. So when you come in for the lead placement, whether you're asleep or awake, uh, the folks who are awake um, will talk to them, we'll record their brain waves, we'll put in the wires, we'll test to see if they're getting good function, and we'll test to see if we're uh, getting any side effects from the spread of the current and adjust the lead location. You spend the night, most people end up going home the next day. And then the week after you come back in where we hook up the brain leads to extension wires to a generator that will then sit under your collarbone like this. We talked about that. So, and this particular type of frame technology can be used in the intraoperative MRI. So we can use this to do a sleep cases as well. These are just a few, this is a 3D reconstruction model of how we do the planning. This is the skull. This is the top of your head. This is how the frame sits on it. Um, this is the frame during surgery um, inside an MRI machine. So I know a lot of my patients will ask me about what the hardware looks like and um, there it, it's pretty straightforward. There are three components to it. There are the brain leads, which are these leads. There's an extension and then there's the battery. We have the option of, especially if you're getting two leads, of putting both leads 
into separate batteries. So you have two matching battery pockets on each side. Or we can take both leads, hook them up to extension wires and put them in one battery. So you only have one pocket underneath your collarbone and both options are available. Now it is surgery. Uh, however, we in the deep brain stimulation community are very, very proud that compared to other invasive brain surgeries, we have been able to keep the complication rates for this very, very low. The national average is less than 3%, which is great for any type of uh, brain surgery. So there are immediate complications, which can be, um, you know, bleeding in the brain or stroke. Um, there can be infections. Uh, some short-term side effects or complications that can develop include uh, some confusion, some imbalance in your walking, some difficulty speaking, but these are short-term and improve uh, a couple of weeks after surgery. And then over the course of several years, there is a phenomenon of what's called therapeutic wear-off, where uh, patients will come in, you know, 10 years after their deep brain stimulation surgery and tell me that it's just not what it used to be. It's just not giving them the same benefit. And um, it's a little bit of a misleading term because it's not truly that the therapy has worn off or that the DBS isn't doing its job. It's just that the disease is now progressing. So what I ask my patients to do in that situation is actually turn their stimulator off. That is when they truly realize how much of a benefit they were still getting from the stimulator, even though it wasn't uh, like what it was before or at the time of the implant. And then we are putting in hardware, there are brain leads, there are extensions, there are batteries and hardware complications can develop. But this is something that we are all very um, comfortable dealing with and can take care of with the uh, minimal issues. So talking about some um, advances and emerging technologies, um, in the last uh, couple of years, directional stimulation has come out, which has the world uh, uh, quite excited. Um, for those of you uh, with a little bit of a physics background, you will know that when we uh, are passing electricity through an electrical contact, the field of electricity is a circle and it spreads equally in all directions. However, with this new technology, we have the ability to change the circle into a different shape. And you might ask, what's the, what's the point? Why are we making something that's already complicated even more complicated? Well, think of those several blobs that I showed you earlier in a picture where we had the lead placed in the perfect spot. And you saw how many of those other structures were sitting right next to it. And sometimes we find that the lead is in a perfect spot. You're getting great benefit. But because of the way the current spreads, you are also passing electricity to an area of the brain that doesn't want it, doesn't need it, and is causing um, unnecessary side effects. So what this technology allows us to do is take away the current from that pesky area and direct it in the opposite direction. So your side effects go away, but the benefit that you were getting with the DBS surgery um, and the electricity passing through still remain. Um, just um, this past month, a sensing system has come out. Uh, what that basically means is that um, it can record, it's capable of recording um, the activity of the different brain cells. Um, and there is significant research going on. Uh, we don't have it, uh, we don't have that device for uh, patient use yet, but there is work going on that with this particular type of device that can sense brain waves and sense cell activity, we can then um, train it to uh, electrically stimulate a certain current or a certain signal signal that we see in the in the in the parkinson's pathway so it's it's a smarter system instead of the system being on and electricity being delivered at all time 
it'll be smarter and it will only emit um, electricity uh, when it detects a certain signal. Because as you know, um, there, are, there are good days and bad days and then there are good times and bad times during the course of the day for you. So when you're having a good day or when you're having a good few hours, why waste that electricity? If you're if your system can detect that signal that tells it that you're having a good day, your tremor is good, your stiffness is better, why stimulate? But as it sees the signal that is associated with your tremor come back, it will start firing right away. So there's no, um, there's no gap in your therapy. Uh, we also uh, currently we're in the process of uh, looking at getting this particular technology as well, but MR guided focused ultrasound therapy um, is also something new and exciting to look, uh, look ahead to. Um, what this basically does is that deep brain stimulation therapy um, is reversible right? Um, if you don't like it, if, if there's any issues with it, you could always get the wires removed and no damage is done to, your, to that part of the brain in the Parkinson's circuit. However, in some patients who are not good surgical candidates for several different reasons or still predominantly just have disease that affects the one side of the body and has not progressed to the other side, um, a focused ultrasound beam can be sent to that area of the brain that causes it um, to kill off some cells that interrupts the circuitry and improves the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. It's just that it's not reversible like deep brain stimulation is. And then there's some work also being done with just putting electrodes on the scalp itself um, or a device just on the scalp itself and um, emitting uh, stimulation waves or magnetic waves that may help uh, with, uh, with stimulating these areas of the brain without any um, invasive surgery to, to see if they can benefit people who have Parkinson's disease. Uh, another co very common question that I get um, from my uh, Parky patients and their families is can, if we do DBS, we're putting in metal, uh, will, will my mom or dad or husband still be able to get an MRI? And the answer is yes. We have um, three systems out in the market and all of them uh, can have uh, um, all patients who have any of these three uh, systems implanted can get an MRI under specific conditions. So I'm going to wrap this talk up with some talk about the future with some exciting research that uh, we are doing in collaboration with Michigan State University at Spectrum Health. Um, we are working on a protein uh, called uh, brain-derived neurotrophic factor. It's a mouthful. Uh, in short, we call it BDNF. And its role is important uh, to help with the survival of the brain cells that produce dopamine. Now, you remember from, uh, from your doctor's visits, Parkinson's disease happens because dopamine runs out. And dopamine runs out because the brain cells that produce dopamine die off in patients with Parkinson's disease. And this particular protein um, is very important for the survival of those cells. But this protein has many, many variations. It's the same family, but then there are several types of this protein. And there is some data to suggest that if you have Parkinson's disease and you have um, one particular type of this protein, you, your disease will progress more slowly and you'll have a less severe form of the disease. We also know that DBS stimulation or subthalamic, specifically those two targets that I talked about, one of them um, actually increases the amount of this protein that is produced um, in the areas of the brain that uh, are involved in the Parkinson's disease um, circuit. So what we are going to try and do is we are going to look at all of our patients who have Parkinson's disease who then underwent um, 
deep brain stimulation of the subthalamic nucleus. And we're going to check their saliva to see what type, what subtype uh, of this protein they had, and then see if the patients who had the good uh, variation of this protein are actually doing better. And if the subthalamic DBS actually helped slow this progression down by making this uh, protein an increased amount. Um, future directions with this type of protein would be to basically examine the whole pathway and uh, understand how DBS affects this particular protein. And um, if doing DBS early on in Parkinson's disease might actually help slow the progression of the disease down and reduce the severity of the symptoms that develop and maybe even have some sort of a therapeutic effect that uh, would allow people with Parkinson's disease to remain relatively symptom-free or have mild symptoms for a longer period of time. Because at this time, deep brain stimulation surgery is palliative. We are not curing anything. We are not reversing Parkinson's disease. It's just another way to help symptoms. However, with this work, we might be able to show that deep brain stimulation surgery might have a protective effect. But that, that work is still being done and we don't have any conclusive evidence um, of that. So with that, I will end my, my talk. This is uh, the team at Spectrum Health, uh, myself, my partner who does the surgeries. We have four movement disorder trained uh, fellowship uh, specialized neurologists. We have a great team of uh, PAs who help us day in and out. Um, some of these faces are old because this, uh, this is from brochure that's, uh, that's a little bit older. Um, and then our research coordinator, and of course, uh, Kelly, who's been an invaluable member of our team. So with that, I will open it up to questions. Thank you, Dr. Ali. I just want to say uh, before questions begin, you just took a very complex topic and very clearly and simply presented that information. So I thought that was excellent and I'm sure there are many questions. I know I wrote down some, so we'll open it up. Uh, Thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Ali. I agree with that. Kelly was very interesting. Um, a lot more detailed than what I've seen in the past and um, I really appreciate that. I'm going to unmute everyone right now. Um, and ask questions or you can type into the chat, which is on my screen, it's at the bottom. It's a little bubble that says chat. You could type the question in there or I can, or you can, I think you can unmute yourself if you want to try that. This is Joanne Sheldon. Is it okay if I ask the question now? Sure. Yeah, go ahead. Great. I actually had DBS surgery a couple of years ago at the Cleveland Clinic. And unfortunately, I didn't achieve the outcome that the team thought I could. And so I switched to a different um, healthcare system and um, was all set to have, um, I don't know exactly what to call it, but a surgery to, to more optimally place the leads. And then my surgeon went off on medical leave and he's still off. So I'm looking for another surgeon. And I wondered what your um, wait times are in terms of accepting new patients. Thank you for that excellent uh, question, Joanne. We actually at Spectrum Health um, have made a commitment that for any new patients with Parkinson's disease who come in, um, your, the referral can be placed by your primary care doctor. Um, as soon as the referral reaches us, we guarantee that you will be seen within three to five days. Oh, wow. Um, our cool. neurologist uh, keeps slots open specifically for these referrals that are coming in. So as you can see on the screen, we have uh, four movement dis disorder neurologists. They would be your first point of contact. And uh, 
whoever has the first available within that three to five day time window <clears throat> will will see you. Okay. So it's just a matter of getting the referral placed appropriately. And Kelly, feel free to jump mm -hmm. in at any point about logistics if you have anything more to add. No, I think that was great. Um, I'm happy to send out. Joanne, did you get this information about tonight through um, Michigan Parkinson's Foundation okay. or through my email? I got okay. it through the Parkinson Foundation. Okay. We could always share some follow-up information with the group. Uh, for how to place referrals to make the process easy. Thank you so much. I'll make yep. sure to follow up. Okay. I've got her name. Okay. I'll send you her contact information. Okay, Kelly. Thank you so much. Thank that's, you. So, that's so encouraging. I've been waiting over a year and have been in limbo. So this makes me feel better. Thank you. Joanne, Happy where, to do help. You where do you live, Joanne? I live south of Jackson. Oh, okay. Okay. That's then Grand Rapids is certainly doable. Yeah. Um, we have a question in the chat. Um, what is there an age limit for this surgery? Uh, again, excellent question and something that we um, are still trying to figure out. Um, but realistically speaking, there is no age limit. We're not ages in the world of deep brain stimulation surgery. It depends on how advanced your disease is, whether you have cognitive impairment or dementia that's already settling in, because that is one uh, sort of hard cutoff for us, uh, because we know that patients who have cognitive impairment will not do well with deep brain stimulation surgery. So there's no reason to put them through um, all, the, all the testing. Um, but no, there is no age limit. The oldest person I personally have implanted has been um, 82 years old. When I was in a fellowship, uh, we, um, you know, we frequently implanted octogenarians without significant issues. It's just a matter of figuring out if you're a good candidate, regardless of your age. There's a lot of other factors that we consider. So there's no hard and fast cutoff for us. So how do you determine whether or not um, they've got cognitive damage? So uh, we have a fast track process and I can kind of go back up to that slide too. We have a uh, two day evaluation process where uh, patients come in and during the course of those two days, there are, they are evaluated by seven different specialists. And this is a list of those specialists. Um, the specialists who specifically help us answer this question about whether they have cognitive issues or dementia settling in are our neuropsychologists and the psychiatrist. And we rely heavily on their judgment about this. Good. Thank you. Of course. Um, there's a question in the chat. Is there any pain after the surgery? So um, incisional pain can happen, which basically means you just have soreness in your scalp where the incisions were to put the leads in or soreness under your collarbone where the generator was placed. But I am a very proud of the fact that none of my patients ever get discharged on any narcotic medications. This is surgical discomfort that is very easily manageable with just over-the-counter Tylenol Motrin and uh, does not last for more than three to five days after the surgery. Okay. Any other questions? Dr. Ali, could you just touch on the day-to-day -day benefits that patients experience? Uh, the average patient who would get DBS, when, you, when I talk to patients every day and they are taking meds multiple times a day to manage the various symptoms with Parkinson's, they either would stop taking meds altogether or have a significant reduction in the meds when they get this surgery, ideally. Mm -hmm. So I would imagine there's great benefit to just lifestyle of med management. Um, I was just hoping you could speak to that a little bit. <coughs> experience you've had. Of course. Um, so uh, like you mentioned, um, 
one goal that we have with DBS surgery is to reduce the amount of medications that a patient is taking. And we typically start off by taking the medication that is giving them the most side effects away or at least cutting down on the dose. So just getting rid of those pesky side effects is, is a game changer. You know, no more painful dyskinesias. Um, no more worrying about having to go out in public for a few hours and thinking you'll have to redose your Parkinson's medication and, um, you know, be, be socially uncomfortable or awkward. Uh, and then the sort of the intangibles that get better. People have more energy. They, their mood gets better. They sleep much better because we do tell people to leave their deep brain stimulator on even when they're sleeping and their sleep is improved and they can participate in exercise and the big and loud programs much better because of all of these factors. So they'd see a very significant improvement in the quality of their lives. Um, uh, a very interesting uh, uh, paper that came out several years ago uh, when we didn't have any of these newer technologies and we were just doing deep brain stimulation surgery with that big left cell frame, which is fairly uncomfortable. And none of the centers had started doing the surgery asleep. So every patient that was getting deep brain stimulator surgery was getting it done awake in that big old frame just kind of hanging out in the operating room for about four to six hours at a time if you were doing both sides done. And um, a researcher thought to ask the question, you know, it, it sounds pretty, pretty uncomfortable, right? Um, so they went to these patients after they had had their programming sessions done and asked them if they would do it again. And so they first asked them how uncomfortable it was and they rated it on a scale of one to 10. And most of it, them rated it around, you know, a five or a six just for that specific day. And then the second question was, would you do it again? And the overwhelming answer was yes. Despite the discomfort of the day of the surgery, all the testing that they had to go through, the benefit in the, in the properly chosen patient is so profound that most of my patients will come back and the only regret that they have is that they didn't pursue the surgery sooner. So it's, it's, it's a very fulfilling experience for us as, as providers to, um, along with the patients. Wonderful, thank you. Um, here's a question in the chat. Um, a wife is writing about her husband who has Parkinson's and she said, we had brain testing done on him and they told us that the right side of his brain does not work correctly. Does this make him eligible for the surgery if he's so desired? And what does the right side control? So um, it's a little bit of a vague uh, description and could mean multiple things. Uh, my guess, my, my best guess yeah, is, best guess. Yeah. Sorry, um, I think there was a little bit of an echo. Um, but my best guess is that um, because they determined that he would not be a good candidate for DBS surgery, they were probably talking about his neuropsychological functioning. Um, the right brain and the left brain um, are responsible for different components of this neuropsychological testing. Um, the right brain um, is involved with a lot of non-verbal tasks, which means because your language sits in the left side of the brain and most of us, and I'm guessing your, your husband is a right-handed individual, so his, uh, his uh, ability to speak and everything associated with speech will sit on the left side. Um, it probably meant that his nonverbal functioning or nonverbal memory was not ideal. His processing wasn't ideal, or he may have been showing early signs of cognitive impairment or dementia, which may not have made him an appropriate candidate. Uh, but without looking at the, at the records and the reports properly, it would be a little bit hard to figure out exactly what that meant. If you wish to discuss these results with the any of our providers, I'm sure we could uh, we could arrange that. We could arrange uh, an office visit where you could uh, 
hopefully go over um, these things and get a better understanding of what they meant. Do I have to shave my hat? There's a practical question. <laughs> And, and very important to the ladies. So as you can tell, you know, I have a full head of hair myself, so I feel your pain. But the answer is yes. Uh, now there is a way to spare some of your hair while we do the surgery. But um, once I show my patients um, what they're going to look like, if I try and do a hair sparing surgery, which is basically shave a patch here, shave a patch here, patch here, patch here, patch here maybe a mohawk here, most of them just tell me to take it all off. Um, the way we do the surgery, the instruments we use um, are very, very gentle. They don't burn the skin, they don't damage the skin, and by the time most of my patients come back to the office for their, uh, for their follow-ups, uh, hair's already growing back. So I have yet to have an unhappy customer. Um, okay, are there um, currently delays in scheduling DBS surgery due to COVID-19? So we're basically back up and running um, business as usual. The only thing that has changed in our practice is we are uh, mandating a COVID test prior to the surgery. And as long as you are negative, we will proceed with the surgery as planned. If you test positive, we ask you to wait the full 14 days uh, uh, of quarantine. We test you again just to make sure that you've gotten rid of the infection and then proceed as planned. Okay, any other questions? No? Well, I'll tell you what, Dr. Ali, it looks like maybe you've got a little earlier evening. <laughs> we'll get off of that about 10 minutes early, unless um, I don't see any questions in the chat. I want to thank you so much for taking time to do this. Um, Kelly, thanks so much for arranging it. Um, I think we all learned a lot. Thank you. And um, I think we'll sign off, okay? Kelly, any last words? or? Um, anybody, um, I know a couple people asked about uh, possible referrals. Uh, feel free to email Mary Sue with Michigan Parkinson's Foundation or me directly if there's any questions about follow-up um, with Dr. Ali and the team, and we're happy to coordinate that for you. Thank you for having me, Mary Sue. This has been wonderful. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm putting my email in the chat. Can everybody see that? Yes. Al at parkinsonsmi.org. Okay. And if you can't grab that, just go on the Michigan Parkinson Foundation's um, uh, website and you'll see our contact information. Okay. All right. Thank you. Good night, all. All right. Good night. Good night. Thank you, Dr. Ali. Thank you. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you. Okay.